Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Christoph Zielinski, um, president of the Central European Cooperative Oncology Group. Um, it is our particular pleasure that you're joining us uh, via this uh, via internet in these difficult and uh, certainly challenging times for all of us. Uh, the more it is a particular pleasure to have you on board and uh, is a particular pleasure to have gathered a very impressive fac faculty which will lead you through immuno-oncology and uh, some insights. Of course, within uh, a relatively short time frame, we cannot cover everything, but we have uh, very much tried to cover uh, very impressive and important advances in the field of immuno-oncology. Now, um, as I said, uh, the faculty consists uh, of uh, Professor Walter Berger, um, who is a professor at Medical University Vienna, and uh, who will talk on the rationale for the use of immune checkpoint inhibitors. It is uh, Professor Wolfgang Köstler, again, Professor uh, of Medical Oncology and Internal Medicine at Medical University Vienna, who will talk about immune checkpoint inhibitors in advanced lung cancer. And um, uh, of course, uh, very prominently so, uh, Professor Manuela Schmiedinger, who is uh, again a professor of medical oncology and, uh, uh, and internal medicine at Medical University of Vienna, who specializes very, very much, as you all know, in the field of renal cancer and its treatment, and who will talk about this very topic to us. Uh, this having said, um, it is uh, again uh, worthwhile to mention that immune checkpoint inhibition and the concept of it, uh, of this has been awarded the Nobel Prize uh, only uh, two years ago um, and uh, has uh, developed enormously and very actively in clinical oncology and in the field of uh, the treatment of almost uh, every uh, malignant disease. Therefore, um, it is in fact uh, not conceivable uh, that uh, this should be omitted in uh, the majority, uh, in the treatment of the majority of cancers. The Central European Cooperative Oncology Group, ladies and gentlemen, is devoted not only, as you might know, to the performance of uh, controlled clinical studies, but uh, has very, very much moved into the field of continuing medical education. And that because we have found and we have realized that continuing medical education is a inherent uh, part of the administration of most innovative drugs and their understanding. That is why we're also having this uh, webinar today. And um, I uh, want to go in directly into the first talk, uh, which will discuss with you the rationale for immune checkpoint inhibitors in cancer treatment. And Professor Walter Berger will take now over and uh, deliver the lecture. Thank you very much. I will talk a bit about the rationale for immune checkpoint inhibitors in cancer treatment. As uh, Professor Zielinski already said in his introduction, I'm a, I'm a cell molecular biologist uh, and I uh, do research mainly on that. So I'm not a clinician, but I work very close with clinical partners like also in the panel today. That's my disclosures. Thank you very much. So uh, from the beginning or from very early times of cancer research, it has been known and it has been suggested that cancer is also a disease of the immune system. I just show here a very early experiment uh, that is a classical one, um, just having mouse models. So uh, exposing mice to carcinogens uh, leading to tumors. And it has been uh, seen very early onwards that when you suppress the immune system, when you use a mouse that is not immunodeficient, uh, much more tumors will grow and the tumor uh, uh, growth characteristics are uh, more rapid, more aggressive. So obviously the normal immune system is there to, uh, uh, to protect us against uh, uh, malignant diseases. Um, and uh, obviously this is a process going on more or less all the time in our body that uh, all our billions of cells are undergoing exposure to mutational substances, to viruses, to whatever in, uh, might bear inherited genetic mutations. And so uh, 
it uh, there are always cell clones that might uh, that might undergo mutation that might behave not correctly and the immune system and this has also been recognized during the last decades in immunology very strongly is a very well equipped not to uh, uncover only what is foreign like a bacteria coming from outside to our body but also cells of our own body uh, not behaving to the rules, just exposing, uh, exposing uh, at, the, at the surface wrong antigens or trying to switch off the, the report uh, to the immune system that only beneficial uh, um, proteins are produced, let's say, and only uh, uh, the, 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 the role as a healthy cell is played in the body. And so all the time the immune cells walk around in our body and try to, to, to uncover cells that do not behave correctly via these uh, uh, antigens or via the behavior of these cells. And uh, I think very often, and this response is a very strong one involving several compartments of the immune system, uh, the body system works very well and in cooperation between different immune compartments it comes to elimination of these cells. Uh, it can happen by different reasons that one of these clones manages to fly under the radar of immune detection and then maybe can survive and maybe this will be a very long time, long before we get the diagnosis of, of, a, of a cancer disease uh, that uh, such cells may persist, may have like a fight in the dark immune system against this evolving malignant cell clone and that at one point these, uh, 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 these malignant clones might escape from the immune control and then it comes to cancer, a disease that can also be diagnosed. And please be aware that these are really multifunctional, this suppression of uh, uh, malignant clones. It's not only done by immune cells, it's, it's cytokines, it's a lot but very central to it, and that is the, the, this new very important thing in cancer therapy now, are negative regulators of the immune system that are there like checkpoint molecules. And you know, generally, immunology, you can imagine, an immune reaction is extremely, extremely efficient. So uh, we need to, our body needs to control immune reaction, otherwise we would die from immune hyperactivation. So uh, every activation of an immune cell already is connected to its switch off again. And there these checkpoints play a very important role and it shows how delicate this balance is that uh, the immune system has to follow between uh, being very efficient towards invasion from outside, also towards malignant clones, but at the same time has to protect our normal body uh, from, uh, from overactivated immune reactions and immune destruction. Here a bit textbook knowledge on this slide just for those that may be a bit far away already from immunology. So please always keep in mind that we have this innate immune system that's there basically from the beginning of multicellular organisms. Here are the cell types on the left side, and then from vertebrates on the adaptive immune system. So obviously, as this body, as these multicellular bodies became bigger and bigger, it's it, the, the innate immunity that just does pattern recognition, like surfaces of bacteria and so, also very, very efficient, was not sufficient enough to protect from uh, infections. And then this fascinating adaptive immunity uh, developed, uh, mainly consistent of T and B cells, and uh, which is uh, extremely efficient, extremely specific, uh, extremely adaptive, having a memory staying there for more or less the rest of your life, but on the other side also underlying a very, very stringent control to be activated. Because when you think you activate a T-cell clone against an antigen, the body has to face that these cells exposing these antigens will be really uh, attacked uh, all over the time. And uh, the thing is, it's also not eradicated. It can stay as a memory and it can learn. So for sure, immune recognition is the ideal cancer therapy. And we knew that from a long time on, but uh, we missed like uh, 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 we, 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 were, we were giving gas in our cars without uh, taking the foot from the brake. And so the new thing is we have to release the brake and then the activation can work perfectly. 
but consider obviously what I've shown before, this malignant process with an adaptation of the immune system and the tumor cells in parallel, uh, this would be kind of an universal cancer therapy because uh, basically I'm quite sure that every tumor is a tumor also of, uh, is a, a disease of immune failure. And uh, as I said, if we have an antigen this is there, that is there on every tumor cell, this system, this adaptive system is extremely efficient, extremely specific. Look, these are the numbers of estimated B cell receptors, so antibodies and T cell receptors. So this is even a projective immunity. So when you consider aliens would come uh, to, the, to, to Earth, uh, it's quite uh, uh, quite sure that we will already have like an immunity, like a projective immunity against them. But how can we induce and enhance the immunogenicity of tumors? That is the question here. Uh, just a very short, uh, uh, um, like uh, going back to textbook knowledge. Uh, so for being really, uh, really defeat cancer, we need a full anti-cancer immune cycle under uh, um, or on the contribution of several cells of the innate and acquired immunity. So this anti-cancer immune cycle is for me a very nice example how these two immune systems really cooperate. So when you have here tumor cells and uh, best is maybe you have dying tumor cells from any attack maybe from the innate immunity and they release antigens, they re release proteins that are not correct, that are from translocations, that are not there, so that are recognized as foreign. Uh, dendritic cells will, 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 will eat these uh, parts of tumor cells or, or other, anti or other uh, phagocytic cells will present it in the lymph node. And here, you know, you have this first barrier to specificity. It has to find a T cell, uh, an immature T cell that by its T cell receptor exactly detects this antigen. And this is a critical point for the later part of the talk. So this is not only recognition, which is already a, a very unlikely event, but in the same moment here, you have co-stimulatory signals. This must happen in the correct microenvironment, in the correct cytokine and chemokine environment that full activation of these T-cell clones can happen. But when it happens, then it's fulminant. They start to proliferate. They start to get very, very active. They migrate, we are here in the lymph node, you know, they migrate out, they go through the bloodstream, go back, recognize via the T cell receptor, the antigen again presented by the tumor cells, via MHC class one, and they will do an e extremely efficient killing of these tumor cells. It's, I saw a film now from a company that said they had two green fluorescent T cells and put it in a big uh, flask full of thousands of, of cancer cells and it took four hours and all the cancer cells were in apoptosis. So if the system runs, this is extremely, extremely efficient. So cancer cells have avoid, uh, have um, a lot of possibilities or have uh, developed a lot of strategies, let's say, to circumvent this attack because this is so efficient, involving several cell types. I think Professor Zielinski will also talk here about some of them. And one critical component in many of these uh, mechanisms are checkpoint inhibitors that can be, so the negative immune regulators, the healthy signals that would switch off after an infection, the immune system again. Uh, and here either executed by the cancer cells itself to switch off or by attracting, for example, immunosuppressive cell compartments like T-Rex or MDCs. And I think that was the reason why the Nobel Prize, as already mentioned by Professor Zielinski, was given 2018 to James B. Ellison and Tasaku Honcho, because they recognized that when blocking these negative regulators, like here shown in this graph for CTLF4, uh, they, uh, the immune activation is much easier, can be much more fulminant. And because these negative regulators, here we have now this antigen presenting cell I mentioned before sees a T cell, an immature T cell, the, the T cell receptor match with the antigen presented on MHC is perfect, but you need an additional, let's say, one or two uh, signals uh, directly by, by cell cell contact, like here CD28 with CD86, and you need the right uh, cytokines and the right environment, and then this T cell clone can proliferate. 
But when this diesel gon express, for example, here CTLF4, the first target of the checkpoint inhibitors that was really in the clinic with ipilimumab, you see then this interaction is blocked and the activation doesn't go on. But even more dramatic, these uh, antigens that you have here, that might be a nice tumor antigen, might be hit with tolerance, with kind of peripheral tolerance. This T cell might be exhausted, might die, but might also convert into a regulatory T cell. And so this antigen is more or less lost for the fight of the immune system against the cancer. And this signal is not just one. You see here a list of all these activating and inactivating systems. Most famous in therapy, you will all know from, clin from the clinic, is PD-1 and PDL one with all the antibodies blocking here in these interactions side, either at the side of the receptor or the ligand, uh, uh, pembrolis or nivolumab. But there are also other ones. And you can, for example, combine an inhibitor blocking antibody with an agonist for an activating, like, uh, uh, you know, Oxfoli is here also in clinical uh, development. And you have to always consider that this interaction is not going only on, on here uh, between antigen presenting cell, so the dendritic cell and T cell, but also the other interactions. So here you would have now a, such an inhibitory T Rex cell. Uh, inactivating the antigen processing cell. And you have again here a lot of checkpoint inhibitors. For example, TIGIT, as you might know, uh, that is now a very hopeful target based on recent reports on international meetings uh, that this, uh, the blockhead could uh, have to be a very nice new checkpoint inhibitor that could work, especially in lung cancer. So what do the checkpoint inhibitors allow to the tumor cells they are kind of wearing the magic hat, like here in Harry Potter, and the tumor cell goes there, it, 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 it's fully activated, uh, the, the, the immune cell goes there, the T cell, it's fully activated, it recognizes the, the antigen, but uh, the tumor cell just switches off uh, via these inhibitors. Uh, the the uh, T cell, that would be mainly the job of PDL1 here, uh, and in contrast, CTLF4 is more working at the lymph node as shown before. That's also why you see different side effects or so a different like intensity of the immune stimulation when you use a CTLF4 inhibitor as compared to PDL1 inhibitor. And Allison has very nicely shown also in a very recent paper that when you combine it, like we do now a lot in the clinic, there comes additional components. It's not like just adding, it's like, like a, a hyperactivation of immune reactions at different levels. It's a very interesting paper last year of the Allison group. What I just want to mention is whenever you have interferon gamma for any activation of the immune system of, of, of stress, the, the, the cells will immediately upregulate PDL1. That is a, one of the most efficient trans activation I've ever seen in my research career. So whenever you get a, a trace amounts of interferon gamma, this gene is switched on. So this reflects obviously the importance that we protect our own body from, uh, uh, from an immune attack. Yeah? So the system is complicated because we have to be at the right time. Otherwise the checkpoints are upregulated and upregulated like in a cascade. Here, uh, I just put in one observation from a nature paper two years ago because it really fascinated me how, uh, how, uh, how also bright uh, these cancer cells spoken in a picture are to avoid immune destruction. This paper showed that uh, tumor ce tumors um, cells send out to the periphery exosomes, so small uh, membrane vesicles that are full of PDL1 and so uh, and that can inactivate the immune system. So these tumor cells do not have to go out uh, to the periphery to directly switch off uh, the immune cell by a direct contract, a contact. They can do a system-wide uh, dampening of the immune reactivity and maybe prepare metastatic niches somewhere for where, where tumor cells have not arrived before. And this paper shows very nicely that these uh, PDL1 expression on exosomes is strongly predicting response to clinical checkpoint inhibitor therapy. The other thing uh, you might know, I mean, what we need is the cells to be recognized. These cancer cells have to be foreign. So they have to have uh, wrong antigens, danger associated pattern, whatever on their surface. So it's not a surprise that immune therapy works better 
when you have a lot of mutations there because the chance is, is, is simply higher uh, by statistics to be recognized by a, a, a perfect T-cell clone. And when you show here on the left side, I don't know whether my mouse is seen, I hope, uh, then uh, you see we have these tumors that have ha very high uh, mutational burden, the highest when you say MSI uh, uh, so uh, uh, deficient, uh, so mismatch, mismatch repair deficient colorectal cancer with thousands of mutations per, uh, uh, I think this is here per, per, uh, per, yeah. So a lot of mutations shortly. And then you have those malignancies coming from from NOXA that are, that are highly mutagenic, you know, tobacco smoking, sunlight, and using a lot of mutations. And then it goes down and here, you would have like pediatric childhood brain tumors I, do, I work a lot with. There you find only one, two, three, four, five mutations. And so this doesn't uh, respond very easily to checkpoint inhibitors. And most impressively, it has been shown in colorectal cancer when you compare clinical responses between the the mismatch repair deficient in blue and the proficient in in in, in red, and you see uh, the response uh, rate is 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 really massively different. Uh, uh, so uh, the mismatch repair deficient really profit from this therapy. So I always have the feeling uh, tumor in this evolution process as I said at the morning in the fight against the immune system they try to transform and get a tumor with mutations that is non-immunogenic. But when you have so many mutations, like in such a tumor, it's simply no chance to have uh, only non-immunogenic mutations. Then you have to have like a central switch off of the immune system, and that would be activation of the checkpoints. Because it's on the one hand, not every mutation, I can't go in detail because it would be too long, but a mutation is not, is not always immunogenic. Not all peptides are presented on MHC. It's much more different when you have a point mutation. One amino acid is different, so it's harder to be recognized by a T cell, by a T -cell clone than when you have a frame shift where you get a, a whole foreign protein. And uh, it's also the question of the uh, simply of the T cell receptor diversity and the MHC diversity that makes us all different in our potency to recognize uh, a given uh, antigen. And you have to consider that all the tumor cells have to wear this neoepitope, this antigen. Otherwise, you will just select for the cells that uh, do not have it and maybe even promote tumor progression. And uh, this is a bit an older work, but a very nice review by Schumacher and Schreiber in Science, where they have shown that all the classic mutations in cancer we know are non-immunogenic. So uh, it, the, there might be Karas mutations like others than the one we know that might be much more oncogenic, but we simply do not know it because when a cell undergoes it, it's presented to the MHC and no one will get tumor via this mutation. So uh, the only very, very unfrequent mutations in tumor cells are highly immunogenic or epitopes for, for T cells or T helper cells, CD8, CD4. And this has been impressively shown, for example, I always like this early work in non-small cell lung cancer, where they have sequenced the T cell clones and compared to the mutations in two complete responders. So the complete responded to checkpoint inhibitor therapy. And you see here, here two mutations did the job out of 300, and here only one out of all 300, uh, 363 mutations to get a full response. Because the, 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 the positive thing is when you have a T cell clone, as I said at the beginning, the effect is very massive, and this clone can proliferate and can uh, uh, go on and can develop a memory. Unfortunately, there are many resistance factors. Uh, you can imagine the, the, the easiest thing would be to lose MHC class one presentation of the tumor cells, so they cannot be recognized anymore by the T cells. But here also nature and evolution has, has developed a lot of protection mechanisms. So MHC at the cell surface is the strongest inhibitor you can imagine for natural killer cells. And so if uh, as a tumor cell switches off MHC class one, it also has to kind of have an inactivating mechanism for NK cells, otherwise it will be destroyed immediately. But we have a lot. This is very interesting for combination approaches. Uh, uh, you, have, you maybe know IDO, so also metapolites are immunosuppressive 
and many other factors um, that we have all to learn to make uh, this checkpoint inhibitor therapy more efficient. And the other question is, what do we combine? Because, you know, we have uh, tumors where, like melanoma, where a lot of uh, patients respond to even to uh, uh, monotherapy with checkpoint inhibitors. It's a bit less, but still very positive in, in I don't know, we will hear renal cell cancer today from, from Professor Schmiedinger or non-small cell lung cancer. But still, uh, there is there, there's, way, there's place for improvements. We want to make more uh, patients responding. We have now successful combinations from immunoactivating and uh, uh, checkpoint inhibitor therapy when you think about oncolytic viruses used in, in dermatology against melanoma, like topically in one lesion, together with systemic checkpoint inhibitors. There are a lot of studies going on with all different immunomodulatory compounds Antibodies, big success will be for sure be specific by, by specific antibodies that will pull together the tumor cell and the T cell, but do FRB regions. But I want to uh, turn your attention here just to conventional chemotherapy. So uh, it has been considered a long time as immunosuppressive, but it turns out now more and more, and that is also supported by the clinical studies, where in a lot of tumors, we give a combination of either chemotherapy or anti-angiogenic therapy with TKIs and checkpoint inhibitors, because this has uh, an immune presenting function and an re immune rejuvenating function. So when we have cancer, immune system is also in a way exhausted, also at the single clone level. And what uh, these therapies very often do is that they remove the exhausted, the regulatory immune cells, all the T-Rex, the MDCs, and allow rejuvenation of the immune response also against the cancer cells. And, uh, there are, and one other factor that I want to mention shortly is immunogenic cell. There is a fascinating um, mechanism that has been worked out mainly by the Kramer group. Um, obviously, when cells die, and that's not only in cancer, but that's all, all over our body, there are different uh, connections to immune reaction. So there is a way of dying immunosuppressive, but also a way of dying by immunogenic cells. So these dying cells expose or secrete factors that would attract uh, the immune cells to, to uh, the phagocytic cells. So here, for example, when you do that via radiation is here one, but also very famous for an immune checkpoint inhibitor is oxaliplatin. So these cells die and do not only by this dying already release a lot of additional antigens, but they may all, but there is also, uh, uh, for example, calreticulin exposure at the cell surface, very well worked out, which is kind of an eat me signal to the dendritic cells. ATP release by the purinergic system, uh, making a find me signal, come alert, come on, here something goes on, we need uh, phagocytic cells, or HMGP1, which binds to toll like receptors. On the, uh, uh, on the uh, phagocytic cells, like the dendritic cells, and allow here a full maturation, support full maturation and migratory potential of these dendritic cells to really attack then again the still living tumor cells. So that is a concept that we really follow now, but this is not the only way how, for example, a chemotherapy would uh, uh, support uh, uh, the immune uh, checkpoint inhibitors. As I said, Regulatory compartments are hypersensitive to uh, DNA damage, for example, or uh, if, yeah, here I said already enhanced cross priming and so on. There are a lot of mechanisms and data support that, as I said, in the very last minutes of my talk now, I just want to come a bit to newer tumor situation uh, because now it's well established in several tumors, as Professor Zielinski said, in, in later stages or even in first line. But here, uh, for me, fascinating neoadjuvant studies. I will not say too much because Professor Zielinski will focus on it. But this is a very recent, uh, there are no big studies now published on that, uh, neoadjuvant versus adjuvant. But you see here, these are studies with mono uh, checkpoint inhibitor therapy. And here you have the few observations in combination with uh, chemotherapy. And you see the, here the pathological response is now rise sky high sometimes, and this is non-small cell lung cancer, up to 80, 90%. So obviously here massive something goes on. It has been worked out before very nicely by this. It's a series of paper, I just showed the first one of this group 
where they showed very nicely when they give an immunotherapy here, they use a checkpoint inhibitor plus an, plus an activating uh, 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 agonist. And they do the same experiment in the mouse and just do the therapy before or after surgery. And you see the response rates and the survival rates of the animals are sky high different. So obviously the immune reaction is much better when you have a lot of tumor load here. I don't show anything here on, on, on lung cancer because that is presented by Professor Zielinski. I just want to mention here glioblastoma, which is a tumor very close to my heart. Thanks God, not to my brain, but to my heart. And uh, here, the first time that ever we saw a, an activity with checkpoint inhibitors, and this was published in Nature Medicine last year, is when it, uh, the, the checkpoint is given before uh, in a neoadjuvant setting. And I really like this paper by Huang et al, also in Nature Medicine. They gave only melanoma, only one dose of pembrolizumab, and then monitored response, and monitored response on the T-cell clone. And this time is already short, they just uh, see, uh, don't go into detail. But what they show is that already one week after this one shot pembrolizumab, they find uh, a, a proliferation of a T cell clone that before they had only detected in the biopsy, nowhere in the periphery, nowhere in lymph nodes. It's in the tumor bed, and obviously, this uh, uh, T cell clone may be reflecting this old fight I have shown at the beginning between immune system and the evolving tumor, being there completely exhausted, are reinvigorated and start to go on, start to fight locally, go out to the periphery like in a, in an, a, a reverse immune cycle. And so you can imagine that in that situation, uh, the, this, this new adjuvant therapy does already killing of a lot of tumor cells, maybe inducing immunogenic cell death, or maybe that's the question, maybe we have to ask uh, Ed here also like a chemotherapy that does it, making in the tumor already a response that then allows a much more efficient real anti-cancer immune cycle, leading also to dysfunctional T cells and the memory differentiation. And at the very end, I want to mention again uh, one factor in addition that is got bacteria, the microbiome, please be aware of it, data accumulating, it's very complicated, but they are accumulating that heavy antibiotics use will uh, block the activity of checkpoint inhibitors or at least uh, dampen it down. And uh, most fascinating, it has been shown even by cross-species um, uh, experiment by Rauti at all, he uh, did a modeling of the immune therapy with checkpoint inhibitors in mice and he took germ-free mice or antibiotics treated, and he reconstituted reconst uh, the, the microbiome by human microbiome from responders and non-responders. And the interesting thing was when he then treated the mice with the tumors on them, uh, only those with the microbiome from the responders also responded to immune therapy in the murin system, and in the, uh, uh, the non-responder, uh, microbiome transfected. It did not, which is really incredible. And then he found that Akamansia, for example, so Munitifile, I'm not a, a, a microbiologist, when he uh, gave that into the, uh, the microbiome of these mice, they also responded. So uh, it's complicated, but we have to consider the microbiome as one of the factors that will be very critical to optimize this therapy. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Walter, for this um, very comprehensive and uh, wonderful presentation. Um, we have a couple of questions here. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me remind you, please, that you can uh, put in your questions in writing on the, the chat in the chat corner here. And I see these questions and ask um, and, 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 and uh, present them uh, to the speaker. Um, so uh, the first question that we had here is how, um, uh, what are the hypotheses, how the microbiome is truly um, involved in immune checkpoint inhibitor uh, activity and efficacy? How it is involved? Um, right. I think uh, generally this is not, it's not only an immunotherapy question, but it's generally a very immunological critical point that obviously, you know, uh, we need 
we need some, as I said, the immune system is really a balance. So it's not a yes or no thing. And when you already, when you consider tolerance, yeah, uh, those T cell clones are already killed or B cells that do not really interact with MHC class one. And then those are also eradicated that are too strongly recognizing autoantigens. So uh, it's, it's a, a balance in between. And what the microbiome does, I think it's always delivering some kind of activation signal for the immune system. And this has been very nicely shown. That results are somehow a bit contradictory. But basically, uh, these, these bacteria allow all the time, like, that the immune system doesn't really fall asleep. So it's keeping the immune system at a very active, low activated state, allowing very rapid, very full reaction about that. Yeah. And then you can go for details because all the different bacteria uh, or, 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 or other, other uh, you have fungi and everything, fungi and everything there, um, are very different. So, and this becomes much more complicated since we have now the next generation sequencing techniques, because we thought always this is a, not more than a few hundred bacteria that would be in the gut. And now suddenly it's going to, to the 10,000th level. Uh, and sometimes not the, the, the main components of the microbiome, but minor components can have a very, very strong regulatory role also by this biofilm uh, activities and so on. So it's, it's complex, but it seems to be central. But what a lot of people forget at the moment by this enthusiasm about the microbiome is that the microbiome can also be very highly tumorigenic or tumor promoting, and that we shouldn't forget. It's, a, it's, 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 a, yeah, it's a, it's a delicate sword. Right. So the second question that we have here, which uh, I also consider very important, is the role of corticosteroids. Because as you, of course, are aware, um, certain chemotherapies call for the administration of corticosteroids. And uh, these chemotherapies might be administered together, particularly uh, based upon combined um, uh, treatment schedules um, of uh, chemotherapy plus immunotherapy. And if, the necess if the chemotherapy necessitates corticosteroid administration, the question is how much would this influence or detrimentally influence uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor treatment? I can talk here only theoretically. I mean, you have for sure much more knowledge here from the clinical observations. I mean, on the one hand, we know that these corticosteroids, you can use it obviously without doing a lot of damage when the the first activation and the first recognition of a cancer epitope has, has been successfully passed, I think then it works. Then these T-cell clones are so active, I think they, they will, they, they, that will work. And I think it has been shown clinically also that later on you can use corticosteroids. Or, um, when, you, when you have to use it from the beginning, I'm not sure whether this is very good. And I think uh, there we have to learn. I mean, that's what my group in research does a lot with the chemists is we want to have a chemotherapy, uh, maybe just with oxaliplatin or so, but not giving systemically, but via nano preparations or so that, so that the oxaliplatin is only released in the tumor. So that we can maybe have there quite high concentrations, allowing a lot of cell deaths going on, but uh, uh, avoiding the, the systemic immune suppression that uh, might happen in this first window before a new immune system is emerging. But clinically, Thank you very much. clinical observations? Well, uh, there, are, there are, in fact, there are a little bit of conflicting data. I mean, in principle, there was, um, there was the dictum that it would be detrimental to use corticosteroids uh, together with immune checkpoint inhibition. However, there are recent, the recent uh, couple of publications which show that it might be not that detrimental. Uh, on the contrary, that um, this might um, uh, modulate certain immune responses. So uh, the jury is sort of not out or not back yet with the, with the victim. Mm -hmm. Um, it's quite interesting, quite an interesting question, particularly when you consider a, uh, such a chemotherapy and immunotherapy regimens like those uh, combined with uh, paclitaxel or docetaxel, where you, uh, of course, are obliged to use a corticosteroid at the same time. So this is quite interesting. 
it's also complicated because uh, 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 there was a paper in Cell from Shiano, Shiao is his name, uh, it's the Sharma group. They showed very nicely that uh, you can have completely different situations in that respect on different lesions. So they show, for example, that in bone metastasis, uh, you have a completely other immunological situation and by TGFP, the kind of an immune suppression uh, as compared to, let's say, a metastasis which in, is in the lung or so. And so, uh, kind of, you have to find the optimized balance also between lesions in one and the same patient. Right. Okay, so uh, the time is, uh, has come to uh, go to the next presentation. Thank you very much, Walter, for Thank this um, for this um, excellent and very very uh, impressive presentation. Walter is always one of the best speakers we all we ever had, so it's always a pleasure to listen to him. So thank you very much. He's the best. Um, it's not easy to to follow his presentations usually, but I will do my very best by uh, going now on to uh, the uh, presentation, the knee adjuvant uh, treatment of uh, non-small cell lung cancer, uh, which uh, has been already mentioned before, and that is something which uh, we would want to uh, which we would want to cover. All right, so uh, um, here's my declaration of interest. Uh, and the potential conflicts. And now uh, the uh, history of uh, the history uh, of uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor treatment and of cancer treatment uh, is uh, quite interesting to see how um, how quicker innovations really occur. And uh, with cancer immunotherapy, uh, only uh, which has developed only in the year 2010, and then broadly in the year 2014. Uh, we see how much has happened during a rather short time, which you see on the right side of uh, this corner. So uh, um, uh, it is. Uh, it was only logical to expand this. And uh, when you look at the clinical cancer advances, um, uh, which have been published by uh, ASCO, um, and uh, which are important for the year 2020, we do see that the first uh, that the first uh, point shows that neoadjuvant combinations of immunotherapies have paved the way for more successful and less invasive surgery for patients with advanced melanoma. And I will show you evidence that the similar, very similar aspect is also true for the treatment of non-small cell lung cancer. Now, uh, it is uh, in this context that, uh, as uh, Professor Berg has shown, the new adjuvant uh, treatment with immune checkpoint inhibitors in malignant melanoma was extremely successful in that respect that uh, we do have experienced a lot of complete responses and uh, also a lot of near complete responses and they have uh, turned and translated into a significantly ameliorated relapse free survival um, with new adjuvant treatment administered before surgery and with adjuvant treatment uh, administered after surgery of malignant melanoma. Now, of course, uh, we have to go back and think why this might be the case. This might be the case because uh, we have to analyze how immune checkpoint inhibitors work. And they work via first recognizing tumor cells as foreign, second, by the presence of an inflammatory T cell environment with the presence of effector cells. And third, the microenvironment and conditioning factors. So uh, my, the microbiome was already mentioned, but we do have to consider that there's also the immediate microenvironment, which is, of course, of importance in this context. So with immune checkpoint inhibitors, the story is, in fact, more about tolerance and the maintenance of physiologic immune responses and the uh, change in tolerance which uh, might be uh, which might be induced by the presence of a tumor and its suppression of immune uh, of immune cells surrounding uh, the tumor, which are otherwise able to eliminate foreign tissue. So what we do have in immune checkpoint inhibitor treatment is that we are influencing the escape mechanisms of tumor immune editing. So you have to be aware. When you look at transformed cells on the right side of your screen, at transformed cells um, which have evolved from normal tissue, they might 
evolve in three different ways. The first would be the elimination, which is in fact, uh, uh, which is in fact uh, done by, uh, by immunocompetent cells. We second have an equilibrium, which uh, is between normal cells and tumor cells, which uh, we call tumor dormancy. And the third is the immune escape by the tumor cells. This is, of course, uh, very, very clearly, um, very uh, clearly done by um, uh, immune mechanisms, where the tumor uses the immune system and the physiological roots of the immune system to eliminate or to stop any kind of uh, of elimination and to stop um, any kind of proliferation. So what we do have in the surveillance picture here is uh, when you look at the left side of the slide, you do have cancer antigen release usually. And then if you are lucky, you have this antigen presentation by dendritic cells. We do have T cell priming and activation, T cell homing and tumor infiltration, cancer antigen recognition, and T cell mediated cancer cell killing. Now, this is of course something of an ideal world. And we have realized that this, uh, that this uh, surveillance and immunosurveillance it has a lot of defects along the entire circle and therefore leading then to tumor outgrowth and the tumor overwhelming the body's immune system. And that is exactly where we truly are intervening by, um, uh, in fact, right now, three ways to influence the immune system, and that is CTLA-4 inhibition, PD-1 inhibition, and PD-L1 inhibition. Now, there's an abundance of other, um, of other options which we still can follow and which are in immediate development, which we can influence, then leading to an amelioration of uh, tumor um, exclusion and tumor elimination. <coughs> now, you might say, if you would want to uh, be a, a little, uh, I would say, provocative, you could say that cancer truly is an immunological disease. It comprises always a failure of the immune system uh, and possible epitopes um, are leading to a tolerance and thereby to the inability to exclude the, uh, the tumor from elimination. Now, again, most frequent cancer mutations and translocations are non-immunogenic, as Professor Berger said before, and therefore the tumor is able to still proliferate and still become, uh, become an, uh, uh, the dominating process that dominates the body's, uh, the body's uh, processes. Now, the interesting thing is that every novel alteration, because as I said before, the question is what is foreign and what is recognized as self, that every novel alteration might lead to a changed protein composition and thereby uh, produce a chance for the recognition by the immune system. Now, again, as I said before, there's a lot of different immunosuppressive cell types, which you might see on the right upper side of the uh, corner of the slide, sorry, <coughs> where you, you have immunosuppressive cell types. And, um, these are myeloid direct suppressor cells. These are T regulatory cells. These are uh, tumor infiltrating macrophages. We do have an upregulation of surface molecules, and we have a dysregulation of secreted signaling molecules. All this leads to an innate resistance and thereby to a tumor escape and the tumor overwhelming the body's mechanisms. Now, again, again, it is exactly against these factors where we are able to produce and generate a series of different a series of different factors which then lead to the elimination of the cell. Now, as I said before, mechanism of PD-1 and PD-L1 targeting immunotherapy, and that is truly what, where we are aiming right now, is a PD-1 blockade, which is, uh, which is directly influencing the tumor cell and the T cell by, uh, by, by and the bridging between PD-1 and PD-L1 where the antibody administration against PD-1 leads to the, uh, to the paralysis of such a paralysis which the tumor cells exert upon the T cell. Very similarly so, PD-L1 blockade 
again is um, uh, again is influencing uh, a similar mechanism only from the reverse side. But we do have also other uh, other mechanisms like preventing of PD1 interaction. We do have antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity, which might be present on tumor cell, but also on the immune cell, and thereby we do have a series of different mechanisms which can be induced by the administration by the use of such immune checkpoint inhibitors. Now, of course, there is a tumor immunity continuum where we do have a series of different mechanisms which happen. And that is, uh, that is not only the inflamed, uh, the inflamed surroundings with uh, tumor cells being or the tumors infiltrating by immunocompetent cells um, and thereby a production of cytokines that in, like interferon gamma, um, where we have uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes and we have a, uh, then intact antigen presentation. But we do have also other options, like for instance, immune exclusion or immune desert situations where uh, in immune excluded cells, C T cells, CD8 plus T cells are accumulated but are more or less on the rim of the tumor and have not efficiently infiltrated or even immune desert situations where CD8 plus T cells are completely absent. So we know that this is very often induced by uh, molecular mechanisms. And we know that, for instance, EGFR mutation leads to such a molecular mechanism, which then leads to immune desertion and thereby to an absence of T cells, therefore explaining why, for instance, EGFR mutations and uh, tumors uh, with EGFR mutation lung cancer do not respond well to immune checkpoint inhibitor treatment simply because uh, CD8 plus positive T cells are absent. So where, we, uh, where we're looking at is that, uh, that in correlation to this situation, whether the tumor is inflamed, immune excluded, or the immune deserted, we have either a very good response to PD-1 or PD-L1 inhibition, or we have a defective response or an in, in, insufficient response, particularly in the immune desert phenotype. Now, we do have a series of factors which predict response to immune checkpoint inhibitors. So this is a very, very important aspect and a very important topic to realize what are truly biomarkers where we could hope uh, that they would explain to us why a certain tumor or a certain patient with a tumor is responding uh, to a certain treatment with immune checkpoint inhibitors. Now, first, we do have the tumor mutation burden. The tumor mutation burden, which is uh, important, it is predictive. It is not only prognostic, it is predictive. It covers multiple cancer types and uh, has been the basis for the agnostic registration of immune checkpoint inhibitors. We do have PDL1 expression. PDL1 expression, again, is predictive. Um, you have to be aware that this is not something which truly is a biomarker for an individual but rather as a biomarker for a population of, uh, of, of patients or a population of tumors, uh, where we do know that uh, tumors with a high PDL1 expression respond better to immune checkpoint inhibitor treatment, for instance, non sponsor lung cancer, than tumors who, uh, which do not have such a uh, PDL1 uh, overexpression. Now, we can be very easily analyze this by immunohistochemistry, chemistry, and that is something which has really turned into routine. Now, where we have another factor which is predictive is the t-cell repertoire and the clonality change like for instance in melanoma uh, and you have uh, there a possibility to realize what kind of t-cells are present in the environment this is the t-cell inflamed microenvironment uh, where we again can say whether uh, whether the tumor is uh, inflamed or it is immune deserted of course these are all investigations which are not clearly uh, uh, clearly defined concerning the validation, but they are scientifically important to manage. Furthermore, TGF beta expression, which is again predictive, and this is in colon cancer and also neurothelial cancer, an important aspect. Um, it is negatively associated with a favorable clinical outcome, as uh, the others are positively associated, and seems to be also of importance. Now. Another aspect which has been mentioned before, which I want to stress again, is the uh, tumor mutational burden, which is more and more becoming an important aspect, not only in, uh, 
in, uh, in diagnostic registration, but also in our everyday life. Just look at colorectal cancer. Patients with a high tumor mutational burden with colorectal cancer respond well to treatment with immune checkpoint inhibitors concerning the objective response rate as compared to patients who have a low uh, tumor mutational burden and colorectal cancer where there's no response or a very little response um, when they are being treated with immune checkpoint inhibitors. Now, let me come back and uh, ask the question now, why neoadjuvant chemotherapy or why neoadjuvant therapy in, uh, in general is such a good example for the efficacy of immune checkpoint inhibitor treatment? Now, we know, and that is something which uh, I consider very important, uh, that we are doing a lot of things uh, and have been done a lot of things simply by administering chemotherapy and thereby modulating immune effects. So there are a series of immunological effects of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, which are known in ovarian cancer. And that is an increase in infiltrating lymphocytes in the tumor microenvironment. It's an increase in PD-1 and PD-L1 expression. It is a significant decrease in regulatory T cells in peripheral blood. It's a restored cytotoxic function of CD8 plus T cells and the reduction of immunosuppressive uh, cytokines like interleukin-10, VGF, or TGF-beta. Now, importantly, um, we have to realize that different chemotherapies uh, exert different effects upon the immune system and uh, upon the different parts of the immune system. And it might very well be that neoadjuvant chemotherapy in ovarian cancer is functioning very well, as we all know, because the very chemotherapeutic compounds that we use in this disease are uh, doing exactly what uh, I have just mentioned and lead to this uh, very important immunomodulation, whereas other chemotherapeutic combinations in other diseases or used in other diseases might not do this. So we have to be very careful in, pre in generalizing certain effects to, uh, to, a general, uh, to a general status. But here with taxanes and platinum, we are seeing exactly this kind of, uh, this kind of situation. Now, what are the advantages of neoadjuvant treatment approaches? In general, of course, it's reduction of tumor burden and allowing in surgery, and also to determine on treatment therapy response and also pathological response to allow prediction of relapse free survival, which we all know has been uh, has turned out to be very advantageous in very different malignancies. But we want to give immunotherapy. The important thing here is that the induced anti-cancer immune response can be and is being supported by an enhanced neoantigen load. So this uh, sort of uh, neoantigen load and the simultaneous administration of immune checkpoint inhibitors leads to a continuing sort of vaccine-like situation where the antigen load is constantly present and enhances the immune, uh, the immune response towards the very tumor which it is targeting. Of course, we have also presence of additional and very exhausted tumor resident cell cl T cell clones, thereby uh, again allowing for uh, the use of a, an inflamed, an inflamed uh, micro, uh, microenvironment and by the activation of T cells which are present and thereby induced to, uh, to destroy and attack the tumor. Now, let me mention here that the mutation load on overall survival of various cancers by uh, various immune checkpoint inhibitors is very, very clear and very, very often demonstrated in very many different diseases. As I mentioned before, there are such situations which are very, uh, which are very often experience a high immune checkpoint inhibitor uh, efficacy due to the mutation load, and that, of course, is not small cell lung cancer. As you all know, therefore, we are considering a non-small cell lung cancer to perhaps be an ideal, an ideal candidate to um, study the effect of neoadjuvant treatment in this very disease. Now, you have to be aware that non-small cell lung cancer is very often a chronic inflammation due to smoking and other uh, inhalation factors, leading thereby to a high mutation burden and thereby to a very good example to use immune checkpoint inhibitors because antigens are being recognized and therefore, and there's, therefore we're coming back to what I said at the beginning, therefore to recognize tumor cells 
as foreign and not self. That is an important aspect. Now, when you will look at this neoadjuvant immunotherapy and the tumor-specific T cell response, and you saw the slide before, we do have two different aspects, particularly the re-expansion and or priming of the immune system by an existing antigen and a, a persisting antigen, thereby leading to an, in, to an increased immune response against this very antigen or the antigens which are present on this particular tumor. Now, this might also lead, and that is important, once you have a complete response, to a memory, to a memory which continues although the tumor has been removed and although the immune system has no direct uh, point of attack in this very situation, but very well might keep going on even after the removal of this antigen. So we truly have a situation here which is reminding very much of, an, um, of a vaccination which otherwise is giving ex vivo into the body to, uh, to induce immune mechanisms. Now, it is important to, uh, to mention here, and that was uh, published by Suzanne Topalian very recently in Science, that there are two potential mechanisms for the enhancement of systemic anti-tumor T-cell immunity. And that is first, uh, concentrating upon the primed tumor-specific T-cell proliferation and differentiation to killer cells, where, where you have to see that dendritic cells are interacting with, uh, uh, do have the tumor antigen, and thereby are presenting this tumor antigen via the T-cell receptor uh, to the T-cell, and thereby allowing for the direct killing of killer cells of the tumor cell when NTPD1 or NTPD-L1 antibodies are being administered. So this is a very, very important aspect that here we do have a continuing, a continuing uh, mechanism which is going on. The other mechanism here is the, pr uh, is the presence of the primary tumor, the um, activation of T cells, and the transport to the lymph nodes where activated T cells leave blood and traffic back to primary tumor, thereby generating this inflammatory environment and microenvironment, which I have mentioned before, to be essential for an appropriate immune response. So we do have, in fact, two different kind, uh, kinds of mechanisms involved here. One is being the um, activation of T cells and they're entering the tumor. The other one is after they have been entering the tumor, then the direct inter uh, interaction of antigen, tumor antigen presenting dendritic cells to these infiltrating T cells and thereby leading to elimination of tumor. So this is this could very easily uh, explain what we are what we are dealing with. Now neoadjuvant versus adjuvant has been shown before, but still let me remind you of that. Stage 3 melanoma, anti-CTLA-4, which was in this case ipilimumab, plus um, anti-PD-1 therapy, which was nivolumab, and neoadjuvant versus adjuvant. You see that response, uh, the uh, relapse free survival, significantly better to be neoadjuvant than in the adjuvant setting, and also the overall survival on the right side. Again, the neoadjuvant setting being faring um, much better than the adjuvant setting alone. Now, we do have a series of different aspects here where the top 100 tumor resident T cell clones at baseline expand more than one fold in the peripheral blood uh, during therapy. And you see this in the right lower corner where adjuvant therapy leads to a much lower expansion than neoadjuvant, uh, uh, neoadjuvant therapy, which leads to a much higher uh, expansion. So, that might very well uh, explain what we're doing here. Now, let's turn now to non small cell lung cancer because this is such a challenging, uh, not only such a challenging disease, but also such a challenging intellectual uh, story due to this, uh, due to the, uh, uh, due to this uh, infiltration of T cells in a chronic inflammatory environment. So we do have a series of different um, uh, of different compounds here: nivolumab, nivolumab plus ipilimumab in the Neo Star, star trial, pembrolizumab, atezolizumab, durvalumab, and scintillimab. 
Um, some of them have been uh, presented very recently. We ha also have nivolumab plus chemotherapy and atezolizumab plus chemotherapy, and I would want to go with you a little bit through all these different uh, through all these different results to discuss with you uh, the outcomes. Now, what we have here in neoadjuvant immune checkpoint inhibitor treatment is monotherapy. So this is only one treatment with PD-1 or PD-L1 antibody, combined immunotherapy, which is PD-1 with an CTLA-4 antibody or PD-L1 with an CTLA-4 antibody, or immune checkpoint inhibitor treatment plus chemotherapy. Now, the first, uh, first uh, major observation in this context was uh, published by Dr. Ford in, uh, two years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, where they were giving neoadjuvant nivolumab only for four times. And you see the, the outcome on the right side, biopsy sampled before nivolumab, where you see this, uh, very, uh, this uh, very impressive picture of tumor cells and T cells being present at the same time. And on the right lower side, biopsy sample after nivolumab, where you see a vast disappearance of the tumor cells. Now, this was not related uh, to smoking status, not very much related to histological subtypes, but, uh, but a, a lot of regression, which was not necessarily related to PD-1 or PD-L1 um, uh, PD expression or the absence of PD-L1 expression, but very interesting, uh, very interestingly so, obviously to a um, uh, to tumor mutation burden. Now, there is immune-mediated tumor regression, which might respond, uh, which might explain exactly what we have seen before. And again, I come back to the uh, publication by Susan Tobalin from the uh, year 2020, where you do have this uh, ingression of T cells generating an inflammatory environment, thereby uh, allowing by the administration of immune checkpoint inhibitor the attack upon the um, upon the tumor cell and its elimination. Now, of course, this has to be recognized in a certain way, and that is being recognized in this case, uh, as discussed by Dr. Forty, between of, uh, uh, in the association between the mutational burden and pathological response to pd one blockade. And you see here quite clearly and quite nicely that they have a major pathological response in such cases where you have a high number of sequence alterations in uh, pre-treated tumors, in um, uh, non-pre-treated tumors, and then following their treatment um, in particularly these very tumors, which have a high uh, number of sequences. Now, um, of course, there is an impact of tumor mutation burden in general in cancer, as we said before, and we do see this here, that particularly in lung cancer, we do have tumors which uh, have a very high tumor mutation burden of more than 10 mutations per megabase. So again, here in, uh, in, uh, in lung cancer, we seem to have an ideal model for not only the generation of an infiltration, but also um, uh, the uh, destruction of tumor cells via the recognition as being non-cell. Now, a bigger trial here was uh, published at ASCO 2019 with neoadjuvant nivolumab or nivolumab plus ipilimumab for non-small cell lung cancer. And this was the NEOSTAR study, which was uh, presented by Dr. Cascone. Now, the NEOSTAR phase two study uh, checked nivolumab versus nivolumab plus ipilimumab on days one, 15, and 29, and then followed by surgery, and then the analysis uh, via CT, PET-CT, or uh, histology. And what you see here, and uh, quite impressively so, is that uh, complete remissions were very high, which were achieved up to 25%, uh, in another population 17%, general 33%, and evaluable and resected on trial with 30% of patients. So you see that there, were, uh, that there was an excellent response to such neoadjuvant treatment and uh, resulting in complete remissions in a very uh, big percentage of patients. Particularly, um, there were uh, very many patients who responded well to um, uh, radiographically, and this was independent of a radiographic response where you could see that complete remissions uh, occurred, although the radiographic response was not, was not that remarkable. So radiography does not seem really uh, to be a good predictor in this context. 
Now, uh, it is, of course, neoadjuvant treatment is associated with an increased T cell repertoire diversity and reactivity in the tumor and surgery. And you see this uh, quite nicely the tumor richness at surgery is being induced by nivolumab, but also by the addition of ipilimumab, which is important in this very context to see that ipilimumab, as we all know, influences the microenvironment quite, quite remarkably, where we do have an increase in diversity, particularly in the, uh, under the inclusion of ipilimumab. And in the resected tumor, we do have a much higher clonality um, uh, than uh, uh, with ipilimumab under the inclusion of ipilimumab uh, uh, than with nivolumab only. So you see this very importantly that this diversity and reactivity increases quite remarkably. Now, we do have a series of neoadjuvant immune oncology monotherapy trials. And as I said before, the AFORDA trial, the NEOSTAR trial, and others have all tested for that. And you see that, uh, that uh, uh, pathologic complete remissions are quite, quite, uh, quite often seen um, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, in the uh, specimens, in the surgical specimens, or major uh, partial remissions are present in a very high percentage even, up to 45% in the FORDA trial, for instance, up to 40% in the MSK 3475 trial, and up to 46% in the GAO trial. So you see that that is something where it is not unusual to see very major responses. Now, let me turn now here to uh, the combination of chemotherapy, which I have mentioned before. Mechanism of immunogenic tumor that's induced by chemotherapy are quite remarkable. And we know that, that chemotherapy is influencing, is influencing immunotherapy. Now, for, of course, this is not only dependent upon an increase in antigen expression and antigen uh, release via such uh, compounds like anthracycline, cyclophosphamide, or, or exaliplatin, but also on the direct, um, on the direct uh, influence upon certain uh, cell populations, which then lead to a uh, major response. Now, let me mention here a, a publication uh, which was uh, published very recently by Catherine Shu from Lancet Oncology. This is, I think, from last week. Neoadjuvant atezolizumab plus chemotherapy in patients with resectable non small cell lung cancer, pathological and radiographic responses. And you see here quite uh, impressively that patients who are PDL1 positive had a, um, a very high degree of pathologic regression. Whereas patients uh, who are, uh, had the best radiographic response differed quite, uh, qu quite significantly from this uh, major pathologic uh, regression that was described above. So it might very well be that you do not have this, uh, this very clear interaction between the pathological response and the radiographic responses. Now, again, here's disease-free survival and overall survival, and you see that patients who have received neoadjuvant at azelizumab and chemotherapy fare quite well in uh, disease-free survival and uh, uh, fare particularly well in overall survival, thereby supporting what I said before, the ongoing response and treatment. Now, importantly so, the uh, last week has experienced uh, another publication by Mariano Provencio, neoadjuvant chemotherapy and nivolumab in respect to resectable non small cell lung cancer, which was a phase two trial. And you see here the very, very impressive results here that a lot of patients during time had a very, very impressive response, dark blue, major pathological response, and, and light blue, complete pathological response. So that is something where you are, where you really feel very confident that the addition of immune checkpoint inhibitor to a chemotherapy leads to a very impressive um, uh, outcome. And not only in the outcome itself, but also in progression free and also even more so in overall survival, although the, the, the time of observation is not really overwhelming yet. So we, in principle, we do have uh, a lot of results which show that the, uh, there is significant efficacy of neoadjuvant immune checkpoint inhibitor based treatment. And that involves not only nivolumab as monotherapy, but also nivolumab plus ipilimumab, other compounds like atezolizumab, pembrolizumab, scintillimab, but also very impressively so nivolumab plus chemotherapy, as I showed this before, 
where we have very, very high response rates, where we have a very high percentage of patients allowing for to go for surgery, a very high percentage of patients with major uh, partial remission uh, pathology or even pathological complete remission amounting to 59% of cases in the, uh, in the paper that I showed you published in uh, The Lancet very recently. So that is very encouraging and leads to a series of ongoing prospective phase three neoadjuvant trials where we have nevo IP versus NEVO uh, chemotherapy versus chemotherapy. We have the Empower 030 trial, Atazolizumab plus chemo versus chemo plus placebo. The KEN 671 trial, KEN 671 trial, Febrilizumab and chemo versus chemotherapy. And the again trial, Duvalumab chemo versus chemotherapy. So, uh, but of course, these results are not uh, pr present instantaneously and will need until the year 23 or 24. Now, there's of course a lot of challenges in neoadjuvant immunotherapy inhibitor treatment. And that, of course, is uh, predictive biomarkers, which I mentioned before. Right now, we have PDL1 and 2 1 mutation burden. It's the neoadjuvant strategy. The question is uh, what is the best approach? Is it combined? Is it uh, immune monotherapy? Is it with chemotherapy together? Here, we seem to have an answer. Nivolumab, for instance, plus chemotherapy seem to have an excellent response. We have, of course, to ask what uh, the questions of hyperprogression are, what the questions of radiology are in this context, and what, how much radiology can help us to assess patients who are surgically amenable. And for instance, the question is whether there is a role for all tumors, only for such tumors which have certain characteristics, like the inflammatory uh, microenvironment or the predisposition by chronic inflammatory disease, like, for instance, in lung cancer, in smokers. And the question is the re-challenge afterwards. So uh, we don't know really what happens when patients progress and then we offer them immune checkpoint inhibitor treatment. How does this function? How does this work uh, when you uh, have patients who have been treated with immune checkpoint inhibitor treatment? So we are coming to a, uh, to a series of conclusion, conclusions here. Uh, and the important thing is here to realize that the clinic here is a very, very good proof for a biological assumption of the efficacy of neoadjuvant therapy and or, or of intellectual considerations being proved by the clinic and by biology, which is not always the case. As in other disease instances, neoadjuvant treatment supports the generation of biological understanding of a certain malignancy, and that is what I mentioned. Biologically, neoadjuvant immune checkpoint inhibitor treatment constitutes a, a more attractive approach than adjuvant therapy with first results in malignant melanoma, supporting this assumption in the clinic, but as well as very much so, this is also very much valid for non small cell lung cancer. And the combination of immune checkpoint inhibitors with chemotherapy delivers definitely very impressive results. So uh, I thank you very much for your attention, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure. Uh, that uh, you have uh, listened to uh, to my uh, presentation, and um, I'm happy to answer questions if there are any. Obviously, please do not hesitate to put your questions in here. Okay, so the, obviously there are none. I have discussed this to, uh, to quite at length anyhow, and have almost um, exhausted my time. Um, so the next presentation, uh, we can go to the next presentation, the next one, which will be delivered by Professor Wolfgang Köstler, and that is immune checkpoint inhibitors in advanced lung. Wolfgang, please. Hello, everybody. The topic that I have is a quite broad one. Uh, these are my disclosures, and it deals with all the indications that we have for immunotherapy in lung cancer. So when we look at lung cancer, it's, of course, a different batch of diseases. Um, the majority of which are adenocarcinomas, less than one third are squamous cell carcinomas and small cell lung cancer is getting less and less frequent in the time, um, um, mostly due to changes in smoking habits. And when you look at adenocarcinomas, we know that approximately one third of those adenocarcinomas are readily treatable with targeted agents because they have known driver mutations for which we have good drugs. But for the majority of adenocarcinomas and even more so for squamous cell carcinomas or small cell lung cancer, we do not have any targeted agents. And these are the kind of lung cancers that we uh, treat with immunotherapy. So in the layout of my talk, I want to focus 
on both types of uh, both main types of lung cancer, small cell lung cancer and non-small cell lung cancer. In small cell lung cancer, I will focus only on extensive disease. In non-small cell lung cancer, I will finish on advanced stages, which include stage 3A, as well as limited stage 3B disease, um, which are um, uh, the indications for chemoradiation, uh, followed by immunotherapy. And in more advanced lung cancers, which are not suitable for chemoradiation, um, and metastatic lung cancers. So, um, without losing time, small cell lung cancer, extensive disease, what do we know? What are the indications for immunotherapy? Well, we do have very good evidence from the three different randomized phase three trials that I will go over very briefly. The first one, the pivotal trial, was the IMPOW 133 design. This was a randomized trial comparing the standard of care, which is chemotherapy of carboplatin and etoposide, with addition of a PDL1 antibody at the atosurizumab, and um, for for a total of four cycles of treatment, and uh, atosurizumab was then in non-progressing patients uh, continued until uh, until uh, progression or toxicity. Um, this was the design of the Impower 133 design. The second trial was a very similar trial. It was the Caspian trial, evaluating in another anti pdl one antibody, Durvalumab, very similar chemotherapy backbone. The only difference is that here, not only carboplatin, but also cisplatin was allowed. It was a three-arm trial comparing either platinum and etoposide, platinum and etoposide plus Durvalumab, or an unpublished third arm, which additionally uses a CTLA-4 antibody, Tamilimumab. And the third trial that has just most recently been reported at this year's ESMO meeting as the Keynote 604 trial. Again, similar chemotherapy backbone, platinum plus etoposide versus platinum plus etoposide plus the PD-1 antibody pembrolizumab, again, with the option of continuing pembrolizumab until progression or toxicity. So to cut things short, all of these trials were positive to some extent. Impower 133 was clearly positive, both in the primary and secondary endpoint overall and progression-free survival. The magnitude of benefit was clinically meaningful. The hazard ratio of the trial is uh, 0.7 for overall survival and 0.77 for progression-free survival. Similar results with the second positive trial, Caspian trial results, similar magnitude of benefit, hazard ratio 0.73 for overall survival, 0.78 for progression-free survival. The benefit in, in months is approximately two months for progression free and almost in the same amount for over survival the third trial was a formally negative trial when it came to over survival so over survival was not significantly positive due to the multiple testing hypothesis but the post-hoc analysis involving uh, um, only as treated by protocol patients uh, and not intent to treat patients was positive even at this significance level the second co-primary endpoint of progression-free survival was positive in this Keynote 604 trial. So we have three randomized phase three trials evaluating the addition of immune checkpoint inhibitor, either PD-L1 antibody or PD-1 antibody to the standard of care of carboplatin and etoposide. All of those three are positive, and these three trials have clearly changed the uh, treatment landscape of extensive disease, small cell lung cancer, so that immunotherapy, either with, um, with a PD-1 or PD-L1 antibody, has become the standard of care um, in this setting. I would like to move on and only briefly touch stage three, non-small -cell, non cell lung cancer. So stage three, which is uh, amenable to chemoradiation, which can, encompass, can be encompassed into a radiation field. What evidence do we have here? Well, we have one pivotal trial that was published in 2017. This is the PACIFIC trial, PACIFIC randomized patients who underwent the standard of care of chemoradiation into uh, immunotherapy or uh, observation after chemoradiation. It was a two to one randomized trial, Duvalumab versus placebo, Duvalumab is a PD-L1 antibody, um, 200, uh, uh, 10 events occurred in the Duvalumab arm, 133, 34 in the placebo arm. So this trial was mature enough at the time it was reported. Overall survival was not reached in the Duvalumab arm. 
it was 29 months in the placebo arm, the hazard ratio was 0.69. So this was a clinically meaningful benefit for uh, maintenance immunotherapy following chemoradiation in patients with stage three non-small cell lung cancer. The importance, uh, what these survival curves also show you, is that they maintain in parallel even after duvalumab is stopped after a year, this survival benefit persists so this is a meaningful benefit that we see in stage three disease. And we look into the, when we look into the details of the trial, we see that it appears to be very important at which time immunotherapy started with relation to radiation radiotherapy. Patients who started within 14 days after the last radiation dose had a much better outcome with um, duvalumab as compared to patients who started later, probably when investigators waited for them to recover from all the toxicities of chemoradiation. And the second important thing is the uh, treatment benefit according to PDL1 status. So this was a trial that is actually designed for all comers in regards to PDL1. It was PDL1 status agnostic. However, in post hoc analysis, the benefit remained or appeared to be restricted mostly to those patients which had a positive PDL1 status. This is why different medical authorities, such as the FDA and EMA, had different decisions on the approval of, um, of Duvalumab. Duvalumab by the FDA is approved for all comers in, by the EMA. So in Europe, it's approved only for those with a positive PDL1 status. However, these results were generated from post hoc analysis, and uh, the inclusion criteria of the trial were all comers. Let me move on to advanced non-small cell lung cancer, so advanced stage 3B, which cannot be treated by chemoradiation or metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. Um, I will show you three slides which give you an overview of all of the immunotherapy studies that have been done, um, that, which are the state-of-the-art uh, slides. But before that, let's go a little bit back into the history of treating non-small cell lung cancer with immunotherapy. So historically, this was, of course, a second-line treatment. The initial trials that were done were four phase three trials, two checkmate trials, evaluating the use of nivolumab, comparing to the standard of care at that time, which was docetaxel. Uh, the Keynote 10 trial, which compared two doses of pembrolizumab to the standard of care of docetaxel and the OAK trial, which is the only one which used an PD-1 and PDL1 antibody comparing to the standard of care with docetaxel. These trials were quite similar. Most of them were pure state, uh, uh, phase three trials. Some of the trials, the trials using pembrolizumab, used PDL1 positivity, defined as TPS greater or equal to 1% as an inclusion criteria. The other trials did not. They were all fairly large size trials. Um, the OAK trial and the keynote trials used all comers, the individual checkmate trials are randomized either patients with squamous cell carcinoma or non-squamous cell carcinoma. The trials differed with respect to the uh, intensity of pretreatment uh, of the patients included and with respect to the uh, option for crossover uh, in, the, in, in the patients within the standard chemotherapy arm. But what you can see overall in the trial results is that the trial results are very similar in terms of magnitude of benefit that you see compared to docetaxel. In all of these trials, the hazard ratio was at some point between 0.6 and 0.75, favoring the immunotherapy. So what is important about these trials, which have been published a while ago and are probably no longer standard of care due to the advancement of immunotherapy into the first-line treatment, is that we do have uh, long-term results already of these trials. Um, the uh, first long-term result was reported for the keynote, the one trial, in previously treated patients, according to the intensity of a PDL1 expression, we see um, long term benefit for more than five years in a fraction between 3.5 and up to 25% of the patients. So, we do see a significant portion of these heavily pre treated patients which received second line immunotherapy still alive after a five, in a five year follow up. That is something we did not anticipate or we did not see in the time before immunotherapy was available. And very similar data are available also for nivolumab from the checkmate trials, which were basically PDL1 agnostic as far as the inclusion of the patients was concerned. We do see, and it is highlighted here in red, a significant benefit 
in terms of uh, in terms of overall survival also in the pdl1 negative subgroup favoring immunotherapy over chemotherapy and when we look at the survival curves we see that even in pdl1 negative tumors um, we do see a small but significant fraction of long-term survivors after more than five years in the, the um in the uh, immunotherapy group which is clearly bigger than the long-term survival that we see in the chemotherapy only group. And also for the third agent for atezolizumab from the OAK trial, just recently presented at the ESMO meeting this year, we do have long-term follow-up data. And these long-term follow-up data are very similar to what we see in the other trials. Uh, Four-year uh, overall survival in 16% of the immunotherapy treated patients versus 9% of the patients receiving chemotherapy. So let's shift gears, let's go to first line. This is where uh, most of the approvals uh, nowadays have been done. Um, there are three trials as announced, or three slides as announced to you. The first slide deals with single agent immune checkpoint inhibitors, and it relates to all histologies. There are three pivotal trials, um, most notably the Keynote 24 trial shown here in the middle. Um, which evaluated pembrolizumab in patients selected for high PDL1 expression, defined as greater than 50%. In squamous and non squamous histology, the comparator was chemotherapy according to physician's choice. And this was a clearly positive trial, both in terms of the endpoints of progression free survival as well as overall survival, with hazard ratios of 0.5 to 0.65. The second trial that uh, used a very similar inclusion criterion was the Empower 110 trial. Um, the positivity or the included population was not only defined by tumor expression of PDL1, but also by high tissue expression of PDL1 by immune cells or either tissue or immune score. Um, this is a sm somewhat smaller population of the uh, or subgroup of the oval patients that we see with non small cell lung cancer. Yet, when in these selected patients, again, response rates clearly favorable. To favored uh, immunotherapy over chemotherapy, progression-free survival, and overall survival, again, significantly better compared to chemotherapy. And um, in the third trial, which was, is shown here on the right, is the Keynote 42 trial. This was a trial which included basically all comers defined only as uh, being uh, PDL1 positive. So this is roughly two thirds of the population of patients that we see with uh, non-small cell lung cancer. Um, so this trial naturally included many patients with low PDL1 expression, but not with absent PDL1 expression. Here we saw pretty equal results by immunotherapy compared to chemotherapy. Uh, the overall survival analysis favored uh, the uh, uh, immunotherapy arm, yet this, uh, this setting, uh, pembrolizumab, is not yet approved for treatment in Europe. The second slide shows you the combinations of uh, immunotherapy, immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, that have been evaluated in the squamous cell carcinoma subset. Um, there are three pivotal trials. I will not go into the details too much. Two of them I will hide a little bit later. A combination of two immune checkpoint inhibitors, nivolumab and the ctla 4 antibody ipilimumab in the part one phase of the uh, checkpoint 227 trial. The second trial is uh, Keynote 407, evaluating pembrolizumab in combination with carboplatin and uh, pachytaxel or nanoparticle bound um, pachytaxel. And the third trial is the Empower 133 trial, evaluating the use of atezolizumab in combination with carboplatin and, uh, and nanoparticle bound uh, pachytaxel. All of these trial, uh, three trials were uh, positive to some extent, clearly positive, the Keynote 407 and the Niva and Ipina will address those trials in detail a bit later. The third slide shows you the first line combination with immune checkpoint inhibitors that we have in non squamous, so mostly adenocarcinoma subset. Here we have a total of five trials, that five major phase three trials that have been published in full text. Um, most notably, the Keynote 189 trial evaluating the combination of pembrolizumab and pemetrexet and platinum compared to pemetrexet and platinum alone. I will address that in, a little, in, in, a bit, in detail a bit later. And a quadruple combination, which was the Empower 150 study, evaluating atezolizumab, a PDL1 antibody with an uh, anti-angiogenic agent, bevacizumab, in combination with carboplatin and pachytaxel. 
this was the second major trial that was published and uh, led to approval in Europe. Let's go a little bit into the detail of single agent immuno oncology trials. The first one mentioned previously, Keno 24 trials, all comers, but defined as PDL1 positive in greater than 50% of the tumor cells, randomized one to one between single agent immunotherapy with a PD1 antibody and chemotherapy according to investigators' choice. Crossover was optional at uh, progression on the chemotherapy arm. And uh, the reason why I'm showing this trial is that just recently at the ESMO meeting, we have received long-term follow-ups from that trial. Uh, long-term follow-up meaning uh, more, than, more than three years observation in the majority of patients indicates that uh, pembrolizumab maintains a favorable advantage in terms of both progression-free survival as well as overall survival in the total population of patients with uh, uh, PDL1 expression uh, greater than 50 percent. And this trial has been backed up by a more recently presented trial at this year's ESMO meeting evaluating another PD-1 antibody, semiplimab. Semiplimab in a very similar trial design, randomizing between single agent semiplimab or chemotherapy uh, according to the investigator's choice in a similarly selected patient population, PDL1 greater than 50%, treatment naive non small cell lung cancer, um, crossover, was, uh, crossover was allowed. And the results that we see are very similar to those trials that we saw in the Keynote 24 trial. The importance of this trial is that um, this trial included a much larger population of also squamous cell carcinomas, which were rather scarce in the Keynote 24 trial. And this is a clear confirmation of the data that we have from the Keynote 24 trial. And this trial was also able to confirm another hypothesis that was raised by the Keynote 24 trial. That was that the intensity of, of um, um, PDL1 expression above 50% really matters. So when the trial looked into what is the significance of PDL1 expression levels when they're above 50%, in terms of uh, the response rates induced by immunotherapy, it was seen that those, this subset of tumors or the fraction of tumors that had a very high expression of PDL1 as defined by greater than 90% or even greater than 60 to 90% had a much higher response rate as those tumors which were 50% PDL1 positive or between 50 and 60% positive. So it appears that those tumors uh, with uh, PDL1 expression bigger than 50% are not a single entity, but may, divide, may be divided in uh, different subgroups, some of which may be even more sensitive to single agent immunotherapy uh, than others. Let me move to um, the second concept that is being followed, and there's many examples of now combining um, immuno-oncology drugs with other immuno-oncology drugs, different immune checkpoint inhibitors, such as, for instance, PD-1 and PDL1 antibodies with CTLA-4 antibodies. Um, the trial that is most advanced and has been uh, reported already uh, at last year's ESMO meeting is part one of the Checkmate 227 trial. This was a trial in which basically all comers were included, um, except for patients which had sensitizing EGFR ARC mutations. Um, and the, the results that were reported were on the subset of, of uh, patients which had PDL1 positive tumors. Those were randomized into a chemotherapy arm, uh, pure immunotherapy arm of nivolumab plus low dose ipilimumab, and an arm of uh, nivolumab plus chemotherapy. Um, so this is the lower part of the, of, the, of the chart that you see. And the results were quite positive. And the pure immunotherapy arm. Uh, had um, significantly better over survival observed as compared to the chemotherapy arm, even in this very liberally selected uh, group of patients defined as being PDL1 positive in 1% or more of the tumor cells, which corresponds to roughly two thirds of the patients that we see. Let me move on to combinations of immuno-oncology plus chemotherapy. So what are the data that we have on immune checkpoint inhibitors in combination with chemotherapy? I briefly indicate that the most prominent trial was the uh, phase three trial, Keynote 189. In that trial, patients were randomized between a standard of care chemotherapy consisting of a platinum analog plus pemetrexate and placebo, 
versus uh, the same chemotherapy combination in combination with a PD-1 antibody. Um, what uh, uh, and and both groups were allowed to receive maintenance chemotherapy with single agent pemetrexate, and the um, um, pembrolizumab treated patients were also allowed to receive immunotherapy maintenance. Uh, treatment was administered until progression or unacceptable toxicity, and the patients in the chemotherapy arm again were allowed to cross over to pembrolizumab or other um, immunotherapies upon progression of disease. This was a clearly positive trial, and I'm mentioning it because also from this trial, we do have long-term follow-up data now presented at this year's ESCO meeting. In the group of PDL1, all positive, all patients. So these patients were not selected upon any PDL1 uh, threshold. It's also included PDL1 negative patients. Um, so in all comers, um, the results in terms of overall survival clearly favored the, co favored the combination of chemotherapy plus immunotherapy, 45% um, two-year overall survival compared to 27% overall survival in the chemotherapy-only group. And uh, this benefit appeared to be maintained also with longer follow-up. When the benefit of immunotherapy was assessed according to the PDL1 level, which was not the primary endpoint of the trial, but when subgroup analysis were performed, assessing the benefit of adding immunotherapy to chemotherapy in patients defined with, with tumors defined according to different cutoffs for PDL1 positivity, it was apparent that basically all of the patients benefited from the addition of immunotherapy. So the magnitude of the benefit in terms of the hazard ratios that are shown here was very similar in the PDL1 negative tumors as well as the PDL1 moderately positive tumors and the PDL1 highly positive hazard ratios were all between 0 0.5, 0 0.51 and 0.66. Of course, the subgroup with PDL1 negative tumors is known to have a slightly worse prognosis as those with PDL1 positive tumors, but the magnitude of benefit that is derived from the addition of immunotherapy is similar across all of these subgroups. Just to mention it briefly, I will not have the time to go into the details, but also for the Keynote 189 trial, we do have a confirmatory trial presented at this year's ESMO meeting with a new substance, Tislelizumab, similar trial design according uh, as compared to the Keynote 189. Again, chemotherapy backbone with a platinum analog and pemetrex set with or without the PD-1 antibody and maintenance. And also this trial was benefit with a very similar, this trial was positive with a very similar magnitude of uh, clinical benefit as shown in the uh, shown in the Keynote 189 trial. This was a purely Chinese trial in the purely Chinese population. So the findings that we have seem to relate to all, um, uh, to, to all regions in the world. Um, one of the trials that is particularly notable in the combination or in the setting of combinations of immuno-oncology drugs with chemotherapy is the Empower 150 design trial. This was a trial which had three arms, a standard arm of carboplatin and paclitaxel and bevacizumab, um, experimental arm employing the same combination plus the addition of atezolizumab, and, it, and, it, and an arm which it did not have the bevacizumab, it was atezolizumab plus carboplatin plus paclitaxel. And the importance of that trial is not only that it additionally used an antiangiogenic agent, but it, that it is one of the few immunotherapy trials that really included all comers with non-squamous cell carcinomas, meaning that it also included a significant amount of patients with EGFR mutated tumors that had exhausted targeted therapy options with EGFR TKIs, and it also included patients with uh, ARC rearranged tumors. So approximately 10% of the population were, pa were patients who had uh, EGFR mutated tumors, and 3% had ARC rearranged tumors. Uh, and what is important, and this is the recent update that we have on this trial, particularly in the subgroup of EGFR mutated tumors, and in the specific subgroup of tumors that have EGFR sensitizing mutations, which have exhausted um, uh, targeted therapy options with EGFR TKIs, there was a clear benefit from the quadruple combination employing an immune checkpoint inhibitor, aptisulizumab, the PD-1 antibody, uh, PD-1 antibody compared to the standard of care of only chemotherapy plus bevacizumab, 
So in this subgroup of patients, which are basically very hard to target and very hard to treat with immunotherapy, there was a clearly clinically many, meaningful um, nine months survival benefit that was also that was borderline significant um, owing due to the uh, low patient numbers. And when different uh, mutations were assessed in the same trial, the most common mutation is the KRAS mutation that we observe in roughly 50% um, of the tumors that we see. Um, we also saw that the quadruple combination employing an antigenic agent and immunotherapy was clearly superior in uh, tumors with a mutant KRAS as compared to the other arms employing uh, no antigenic agent or new immunotherapeutic agent. And um, of particular interest is, are uh, mutations that have recently re been reported in two uh, kinases, uh, SDK10 and KEEP, um, which, are, uh, support, which are reported to be relevant to um, the, uh, the effect of immunotherapy. Uh, in other trials, in retrospective analysis, it has been shown that patients with SDK11 or KEEP1 mutations, immunotherapy may work less well. So in these retrospective analysis of the Empower 150 trials, there was basically no significant difference in the benefit achieved by the addition of immunotherapy in SDK11 and KEEP1 wild type or SDK11 and KEEP1 mutated tumors. So immunotherapy does seem to benefit to all subgroup of patients, irrespective of EGFR mutation status, KRAS mutation status, and SDK11 and KEEP1 mutation status. The last uh, section that I would like to address is the triple combination of combining two immunotherapeutic agents, two immune checkpoint inhibitors plus chemotherapy. So now it's not an immune checkpoint inhibitor plus chemotherapy, it's combining the, the three of them. Um, uh, this is a concept that is relatively new. It has been reported at this year's ESCO meeting um, by the Checkmate 9 LA trial. Um, patients were randomized into a chemotherapy arm which, uh, which was a standard, standard chemotherapy for four cycles with optional maintenance in the non squamous population with pembrolizumab, or two immune checkpoint inhibitors, nivolumab plus the CTLA4 antibody ipilimumab, um, combined with only two cycles of chemotherapy. Uh, certification was according to PDL1 status, sex, and histology. All comers were excluded, but no patients with sensitizing EGFR mutations or ARC translocations were included. And the interesting finding of that trial is that we can very well reproduce uh, the results of the Checkmate 332 trial. Again, the combination of two immunotherapeutic agents plus chemotherapy was clearly better than chemotherapy alone, both in terms of uh, progression-free survival as well as in terms of overall survival, with the notable um, remark that the patients who received the immunotherapy received only two cycles of chemotherapy rather than four, as in the chemotherapy. So to round up this part of my talk, um, what is the relevance of immune checkpoint inhibitors in advanced non-small -small cell lung cancer, stage 3B and stage 4? Well, according to pdl one status, you have different treatment options. In pdl one positive tumors, of course, you have the option of treating with immunotherapy only, Keynote 24 trial, pembrolizumab single agent, or Empower 110 single agent artesurizumab, or you of course also have the option of combining immune oncology agents with chemotherapy, as in the non-squamous subset of the Keynote 80, 189 trial, a platinum plus pemetrex set, or in the Empower 150 study with the quadruple combination. For the squamous cell subset, you have data from the Keynote 407 studies with carboplatin and paclitaxel in combination with pembrolizumab. Very similarly, in the uh, PDL1 low and PDL1 negative, you do not have many options for uh, single agent immune oncology, but you do have the option of combining, uh, um, uh, according to the Keynote 189 trial or Empower 150 trial. And there are novel combinations which are showed in the bottom of the slide, which are not yet improved combinations of two immune oncologic agents or two immuno immune oncologic agents plus chemotherapy as shown in the Checkmate 9 LA study. So with this, I would like to close. I hope that even despite the large field of immunotherapy in non-small cell lung cancer, this overview has not been too confusing for you, and I would be very happy to answer any questions.
Thank you, Wolfgang, for this um, for this uh, very comprehensive presentation. Um, uh, very remarkable. Do we have um, any questions? Yes, one of the questions is, um, what about uh, sequencing treatment, uh, immuno and chemo? Uh, do we have this or are there any data about that? So there were, there were some sequencing trials in small cell lung cancer, um, which were, which were not, not very successful. Yeah. So uh, which, were, which was a concept of maintenance. Small cell lung cancer is a very chemosensitive disease. So most of the patients will anyway respond to the chemotherapy portion. And uh, the idea behind these trials was that the good responses achieved by chemotherapy might be maintained by um, by immunotherapy being added either at some point during chemotherapy or shortly after chemotherapy. Um, in small cell lung cancer, this did not turn out to be a very efficient approach. Uh, in non-small cell lung cancer stage three, where we have the Pacific trial data with chemoradiation, it appears that patients really benefit from, uh, from adding immunotherapy quite fast after the end of radiotherapy. So that, this, this is kind of a supportive uh, trial for the sequencing concept or for the sequential concept, because the closer you move, um, you move the immunotherapy portion uh, to the chemoradiation, the higher the benefit from immunotherapy. And this concept is actually being followed now at the Pacific II trial when immunotherapy started simultaneously with chemoradiation. So it is not really known at which time point we should add chemotherapy, we should add immunotherapy in, um, in, uh, in, in non-small cell lung cancer, but, but the sequence does seem to be relevant to some extent. Okay, thank you. That is um, uh, an important clarification, particularly concerning uh, concerning with radiotherapy. Um, that is uh, that is uh, also registration uh, adherent. Um, so I see no further questions here. So we can move on to the next talk and thank Professor Kessler very kindly for his uh, participation and presentation. And uh, we now come to Professor Schmiedinger, who will uh, talk about immune checkpoint inhibitors as monotherapy and in combination with the cancer. You know, and you're very much aware that renal cancer is one of the really exploding fields of um, treatment options. Um, and uh, also recently at ESMO, we've heard a very, uh, very interesting new uh, outcome of a trial. So we will uh, listen very carefully and are excited to have you with on board to the screening. Please. Hello, everyone. So my task is now to talk about immune checkpoint inhibitors as a monotherapy and in combination in renal cell carcinoma. And I am not going to address the issue on why this strategy works, because I think this has been already thoroughly uh, been presented by Professor Berger. My topic today is going to be how to choose the best individual therapy in a crowded treatment landscape. So we have seen over the last 15 years, multiple paradigm changes in kidney cancer. I'd like to remind you of the year of 2006, where, uh, the, where agents were introduced that target the molecular background of the disease, which is, uh, this disease is mainly driven by the vascular endothelial growth factor. And also mTOR inhibitors play a significant role in kidney cancer. And we learned that these agents really progress, uh, improve progression-free survival and response rates. In 2015, we have witnessed the introduction of immunotherapy for the first time. Monotherapy with nivolumab was shown to be superior in terms of overall survival when compared to the mTOR inhibitor Everolimus in second line in patients who had failed tyrosine kinase inhibitor first line treatment. And also we have seen in the same year the advent of uh, what I call resistance TKIs, those TKIs or those strategies that work when um, the disease has progressed despite a VEGF inhibition. So this was a, was a meteor trial on carbozantinib versus Evrolimus, also in patients who had failed TKIs, or the trial, the HOPE trial on lenvatinib. This is an FGF-VEGF inhibitor combined with Evrolimus. 
2017 was another breakthrough in the context of first-line treatment. This was the year when nivolumab plus ipilimumab was introduced. And this agent was shown to be superior in terms of overall survival, progression-free survival, and a response rate when compared to the former standard of care, uh, sunitinib, and the primary endpoint uh, population of this trial was intermediate and poorest patient. And in 2019 and now recently 20 uh, with ESMO, uh, we have also seen the introduction of uh, combinations of immunotherapy plus tyrosine kinase inhibitors. First, um, the, in, the improvement of overall survival, progression-free survival and response rate of pembrolizumab combined with axitinib when compared to sunitinib. And at this year's ESMO, we have seen the result of the phase three trial on nivolumab combined with cabozantinib versus sunitinib, and this trial also revealed to be superior in all three mentioned endpoints. So these are, were the guidelines before uh, the last ESMO, before the virtual ESMO, where uh, the recommendation was for all IMDC uh, risk groups, pembrolizumab plus axitinib within one A recommendation, and for intermediate and poor risk patients, ipilimumab and nivolumab also with a 1A recommendation. And you can see that uh, when these strategies are available, then single agent tyrosine kinase inhibitors do actually not, no longer play a major role in this disease. And now we are currently about to update the guidelines uh, for nivolumab plus cabotantinib, which is also going to be a 1A recommendation based on the trial that I have just mentioned. I have summarized all these three important trials for you here in just one table. I'm not going through every trial. Um, I just want to show you that uh, the longest follow-up so far uh, we have with the Checkmate 214 trial, Nevo EP versus Sunitinib. Um, we have seen response rates in all trials going above 40%, and which is very new for kidney cancer. We have seen complete responses in about 8 to 10% of patients. Progression-free survival was shown to be superior, and this is the most important thing, overall survival. For the first time, actually, in the history of kidney cancer, we have first-line strategies where we really see an improvement, significantly improved overall survival, and also clinically meaningful improved survival. So please bear in mind that these agents have not been directly compared in clinical trials. They have all of these strategies have been compared to the former standard of care sunitinib. So the situation that we currently face in kidney cancer in first line and maybe also a little bit in second line is that we are actually spoiled for choice. We have IO doublets, we have IO TKI combinations, we don't know which IO to combine with which um, TKI. And there is this remaining uh, question, is it really a TKI completely uh, uh, something that we shouldn't do any longer in every patient or just when there is a severe contraindication for IO therapy. So fact is we have three new players in first line metastatic RCC, Nevo EP, Pembroaxi and Nevo Cabo. There is no head-to-head -head comparison between these trials and the decisions need really to be made on a, um, in, in first line. Um, the decisions that we need to make to make is should we offer IO doublet or IO TKI? If IO plus TKI, which TKI should we offer? Let me first address the question on IO doublet or IO TKI. IO, IO and IO TKI are very different ways to address cancer immune escape. When we go for uh, in, uh, nivolumab plus ipilimumab, we, what we do basically is we improve T cell, um, tumor cell killing and we improve T cell priming. When we go for anti-VEGF anti and uh, anti-PD-1 inhibition, we improve um, again tumor cell killing, but we also improve the, um, the infiltration of the tumor um, by T lymphocytes. We improve the migration of T cells to the tumor because we have learned that anti-VEGF agents have a strong immune modulatory effect. And a part of this, we shouldn't forget that, of course, their main activity is addressing the tumor vasculature and in some cases, depending on the TKI you choose, also the tumor cell itself. 
So what are the considerations for treatment decisions between IO doublets, IO TKI combinations, or single agent TKI in clinical practice? There are many factors that you may consider uh, to guide your treatment decision in the absence of head-to-head -head trials. Let me start with age of the patient. What is my treatment goal in an older patient? What is the meaning of complete response in a patient who could achieve a normal life expectancy with a tyrosine kinase inhibitor? And the advantage of a tyrosine kinase inhibitor is that it has a predictable safety profile and the side effect profile is absolutely dose dependent. And patients with low volume disease may benefit for years from a TKI, even when given at a lower dose. Of course, you may say, well, why not giving these patients a TKI combined with immunotherapy followed by immunotherapy maintenance? But there is no data yet for this. There is also an association between the muscle mass, the volume up true level, and the incidence of grade three, four adverse events, which may come into the game when uh, considering uh, immunotherapy for frail or elderly patients. Because in these patients, we have a higher risk for immune-related adverse events due to age-related sarcopenia. Maybe this is due to a higher interstitial blood volume in the elderly with higher distribution of the immune checkpoint inhibitor, but this is not so clear. And then, when it comes to age, there is another risk for elderly people. Um, there is this uh, rarely described phenomenon of hyperprogression in elderly patients. So if you have never seen it, uh, you may think this is a rare phenomenon. If you have seen it once, you will never ever confound this with uh, the phenomenon of pseudoprogression because this is clinically really a very impressive phenomenon. You can see here on the CT scan above the trachea of a patient of mine who had a mediastinal lymph nodes. And after one cycle of uh, nivolumab, this patient developed this uh, stenosis that you can see on the lower CT scan and uh, had really serious troubles uh, from a clinical point of view. Actually, patients with hyperprogression were shown to have proliferating FOXP3 and T-Rex after immune checkpoint inhibitor treatment. And so one idea of approach to address this issue is to deplete regulatory T-cells with radiotherapy or TKI prior immune checkpoint inhibition. Then when it comes to a younger patient, the treatment goal is completely different. We know that in a younger patient, this patient will never achieve a normal life expectancy if we, give, if we treat him only with a TKI. My treatment of choice in this context would certainly be nivolumab plus ipilimumab because with this strategy, we have observed the highest CR rate ever in kidney cancer. In the last update, uh, it was 10.4% in the intermediate and poor risk patients. Another driver for treatment decisions can be toxicity. Chronic treatment with immunotherapy is most likely easier than treatment with a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Most patients, and this was shown for both the Checkmate 214 trial as well as for uh, the Checkmate 025 trial with nivolumab monotherapy, most patients have an almost normal quality of life with immunotherapy. Toxicity with monotherapy is anyway low, and the nevo epic combination in kidney cancer is given four times, and then the patient enters a maintenance phase with nivolumab monotherapy, which again makes uh, the quality of life certainly um, better or is the, the side effect profile easier. What also could drive my treatment decision is the PDL1 status of the disease. If the metastases are PDL1 positive, then for sure Nevo EP would be my primary choice. Here we have seen a complete response rate of 16%, the highest ever reported in kidney cancer. And this had translated into a significantly improved overall survival in these patients. The objective response rate uh, went up to 58%. It's an, always a little bit challenging with the information we have about PDL1 expression. Ideally, we would have PDL1 testing from testing from multiple separated metastases. Um, that would give us an appropriate information because when you look at this uh, tumor, for example, here, there is a heterogeneous PDL1 expression in the same tumor. This is one and the same kidney tumor of a patient. 
And in areas with lower nuclear grade, we, you don't see any PDL1 expression, while in the area of higher nuclear grade, you can see a strong PDL1 expression. And then also the metastasis and the primary tumor do not always show the same expression profile. The metastasis can be positive while the primary is negative and so on. Why is PDL1 expression interesting? Uh, how can we translate this into clinics if we don't have uh, the biopsy or if we don't have this information about the patient's P tumor's PDL1 status? So we have learned from a very nice uh, um, gene ex ex uh, from very nice uh, gene signature profile uh, work done by Dave, uh, by David McDermott and colleagues that interestingly patients with more aggressive disease, speaking of patients with intermediate or poor risk features according to the IMDC risk groups, these patients more often have tumors with PDL1 expression when compared to patients with um, in, uh, with favorable risk who actually more often um, present with a strong angiogenesis signature of the tumor. The tumor differentiation might also be a driver for treatment decision. What you can see here on the right side is a slice from a, from a, a kidney cancer with sarcomatoid features. And we have learned from, these are subgroup analysis from the CheckMate 214 trial, that patients with sarcomatoid features and these patients mostly, these tumors mostly express PDL1, have a complete response rate of 22%. So this is really the treatment to go for a patient with such a kind of tumor. And this translated into a median overall survival that, that has not been reached now and a progression-free survival above two years. Also, inflammation can be a driver for treatment decision between immune doublet or IOTKI. When the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio is high, this may reflect that the tumor has a so-called myeloid gene signature. So how to get this information in clinical practice? Usually, I would look at the blood tests and would look if the patient has a thrombocytosis or neutrophilia. I would do the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. Because if a patient has signs of myelogenic signature in the tumor, this patient is not going to respond to uh, immunotherapy alone. This patient needs, and this has again been shown in the work from David McDermott published in Nature Medicine, this patient who has a myeloid uh, gene signature needs an anti-VEGF agent on board, meaning a combination of checkpoint inhibitor and anti-VEGF agent. Prior tyrosine kinase inhibitor treatment may increase or combination may increase the likelihood of response to immunotherapy. This is uh, more or less the rationale for combining immunotherapy and anti-VEGF agents in kidney cancer. We have learned that VEGF inhibitors increase and activate CD8 cells. They would deplete myeloid-derived suppressor cells and the regulatory T cells. And this is why it's so important uh, to, to consider that these VEGF inhibitors do have a uh, quite important immunomodulatory role. Another driver of treatment decision can be the site of metastasis in your patient. What you can see here, this is a patient with a, um, my, with a, a bone metastasis close to the myelon uh, in the cervical spine. And when you think of a uh, dub, IO doublet, for example, sometimes you would observe this phenomenon of pseudoprogression where the tumor before, the, uh, before shrinking would increase a little bit due to the inflammation there, due to the reaction of the immune system in the tumor and so on. But here in this area, as shown in, the, in, the, in this MRI, you cannot risk a single uh, millimeter or, or half a centimeter of, of increase in size. This is a, a clinical scenario where you need immediate tumor shrinkage, where I would go for a TKI or TKI plus IO treatment. Now comes the question, um, if we consider choosing IO plus TKI, which TKI should we choose? And in fact, this is completely unknown for the moment. We will definitely need more details on subgroup analysis coming with longer follow-up and details from the ongoing biomarker studies. Um, th this is an, a table that um, outlines the different immune modulatory roles of various uh, VEGF tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And you can see that 
in fact, they are they are a very um, this is quite variable in which way they would uh, modulate the immune system. So axitinib and cabozantinib are currently the hottest player, but this may change. We are awaiting of the data of the clear trial, which includes lenvactinib combined with pembrolizumab, which is also um, a very promising strategy. So at the end of the day, we will see is there a best VGF TKI to choose, or is there an individually best VGF or TKI to choose in combination with immune checkpoint inhibitors. A good example uh, for how to choose a TKI is also the, uh, the, the presence of a brain metastasis. Consider or imagine a brain metastasis that is not uh, um, treatable with local treatments such as gamma knife or so. And in general, patients with brain meds need high doses of corticosteroids. So far, we don't, we don't have a strong signal for efficacy of IO in, med, in RCC brain meds. The PD-1 expression also is less common. TKIs usually are not effective either. We have, however, very little data, but some data about cabozantinib here. It appears that cabozantinib, that MET, which is uh, targeted by cabozantinib, is expressed in 35% of brain metastasis, and also the penetration of cabozantinib uh, in the brain appears to be better than with other TKIs. So in such a patient where a local treatment of brain meds is not an option, I would definitely go for a cabozantinib-based treatment, either cabozantinib or nivo plus cabo in 2020. This is just an example, that an example of a patient second-line cabo after progression on pazopanib with multiple uh, bo um, brain meds, and you can see a complete response after 12 weeks of treatment. And here, a, a response to a patient with a radio-resistant brain med a patient with this is a patient with papillary RCC type 2, and he also responded extremely well to cabozantinib. I think the challenge with new therapies in metastatic kidney cancer is that they are approved fast, and they are, this approval is faster actually than is the growth of our knowledge on how to choose the best treatment for the individual patient. The current status is in kidney cancer, we have excellent ingredients, but not always the same perfect outcome because we don't have the exact recipe for the individual, individual patient. And then there is a lot of hope that ongoing studies may answer all these questions about choices in first line, but I'm not sure whether we will get answers. I think we will get more questions. The reason is there are many Me Too studies. They will introduce additional great combinations showing superiority to sunitinib. For example, the CLEAR study on lenvatinib pembrolizumab, also tivozanib combined with nivolumab and carbonivo, which we have already seen at ESMO. More strategic studies um, are important. They will answer some questions. For example, the currently ongoing COSMIC trial, which try to answer the question whether a triplet on nivo, EP and carbo is better than nivo, EP. I think it's a very important question. There is also a question on maintenance. If IO plus TKI is a better maintenance therapy than IO monotherapy after NIVO EP, this is also a, a strategic study that I consider quite important. What we need is really the recipe for the individual patient, a biology based treatment decision where ideally we would get material or blood from the patient. And then, based on the result from the biomarker studies, we would know how to treat this patient exactly. We will need to answer in the future this question, which immune escape is relevant in my patient, in the patient that is sitting in front of me, or we need a better understanding of this theater of war. We have these armed forces, the immune system, and um, to some, in some way the enemy, the tumor impairs these armed forces. We don't know how, is it because of impaired recognition, impaired T cell trafficking to the tumor, is it impaired T cell infiltration into the tumor? Is, it, is there an influence on T cell metabolism and nutrients? Is it T cell dysregulation? Is the tumor inducing T cell apoptosis, hijacking and misusing our immune cells? Is it just the wrong timing or is it just the gut microbiome that has been altered by, for example, antibiotics? And identifying the underlying tumor escape mechanism in the individual patient may reveal even more therapeutic options 
it's not always about VEGF or CTLA4, how to choose. I mean, there are multiple escape mechanisms and multiple strategies on how you can address this escape. Maybe radiotherapy comes back into the field of kidney cancer treatment or metformin. IDO inhibitors are under uh, in investigation. Also giving a patient a boost with epilimumab when he has uh, progressed on a PD-1 inhibitor uh, could be a, a strong strategy. And of course, we may in the future also give a stronger weight on uh, uh, probiotics. Talking about doublets, but some patients may need more than that. And I want to share with you the case of a patient of mine where I, uh, I was running out of treatment strategies and the patient was, uh, as you can see, is a quite young patient and I just couldn't um, offer him best supportive care as an only strategy. So how did we start? We started in May 2016 uh, with sunitinib in first line on which he was stable for 12 months. In July 2017, um, he was switched to cabozantinib for disease progression, but had no benefit from this treatment. We then added nivolumab to cabozantinib. Um, this was completely off-label at that time. We did it anyway. We had to discontinue uh, nivo due to thyroiditis, but we re-challenged him afterwards, and he only had a PFS of four months. He was then treated with lenvatinib, Evrolimus, by the way, an excellent second line or third line strategy. This FGF VEGF inhibitor combined with Evrolimus was shown to provide a response rate above 45% uh, and a progression free survival of 14 months in patients who had progressed on a first line VEGF TKI. So, very good strategy. For my patient, given in fourth line, it was eight months progression free survival. Then we re-challenged him with sunitinib. You can see here in fifth line, we were really running out of treatment options. In uh, sixth line, we treated him with axitinib. And then we had an interesting phenomenon. We had um, the proof that some palpable metastases shrinked actually under axitinib, but other metastases were growing. So this was a mixed response, but predominantly disease progression. And this is when he uh, clearly stated that he doesn't mind if we would treat him uh, off-label or if it was just a, an idea uh, based on immunological or molecular considerations. He basically was fine with everything, but just offering, uh, he wanted to get an effective treatment. So what I then said is, well, I have given you NIVO, you have progressed on NIVO, I have given you every VEGF TKI, you have progressed on this. And then I said, what if we combine NIVO with uh, ipilimumab this, this time? Uh, because this is a different approach, we are kind of boosting the immune response. You have never received NIVO ipi, you have just received nivolumab. And we will keep axitinib because some of the lesions still respond to axitinib. So this is what we did in seventh line. We did a triplet. We started in September 2019, and this you can see in August 2019, the CT scan done before large sternal metastasis, and that shrink dramatically in, um, until December 2019. And meanwhile, the patient is almost in complete response in excellent performance status. What I told you here was all about uh, MRCC therapy in an ideal therapeutic landscape when in an area where all agents are approved by EMA and are reimbursed, where patients have access to multiple lines of treatment, where we do not have restrictions regarding the specific line in which agents are approved and the treatment choice. But what if uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors are your only option in first line? When your reality means first line tick in first line only TKIs, uh, well, I can tell you there is a role for TKI monotherapy still left in 2020. And all of us, we do have patients who may have been stable for years on a TKI and still be in first line and sp still respond very well. And this is the so-called patient with this strong angiogenic signature. And this is the data again from David McDermott. And he clearly showed that in those patients with a strong angiogenesis signature, here sunitinib actually outperformed uh, PDL1 inhibitor treatment. And um, this signature, of course, you will not biopsy the patient. You will not uh, get these results on a genetic basis, but you can uh, observe this signature more often in patients with favorable risk. And, and 
also sometimes in patients with intermediate risk, biologically, they are sometimes very close to favorable risk, particularly when they have just one risk factor making them intermediate. And this is an analysis that we have done uh, last year, where we could show actually that patients with favorable uh, or intermediate plus one risk factor derive a PFS of uh, almost 16 months uh, with sunitinib when compared to patients who have more uh, risk factors. So the intermediate uh, N is one or a favorable risk patient may still be a candidate for um, TKI treatment if you have not the option to offer a combination, immunotherapy combination in first line. Um, and this is uh, really important in this context because if your patient is in, if you have only option to a TKI in first line, squeeze out the maximum, your patient may then live long enough to see the availability of IO doublets and triplets whenever that uh, will be approved and reimbursed in your countries. So to summarize, 20 years after interferon alpha, many highly efficacious treatment options are available in both first and later treatment lines. Due to the absence of head-to-head -head trials, we really need to exploit clinical and biological factors for treatment decisions. The future is probably even more difficult since ongoing studies might be positive as well, and a better understanding of immune escape together with new strategies will further improve outcomes in our patients. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this um, exquisite presentation as always. Um, so, um... We have uh, we have a couple of questions, and uh, obviously one is, uh, what do you do with oligometastatic patients? Um, so, I mean, what we shouldn't forget is that local treatment is always also an option for uh, patients in kidney cancer. It really depends very much on when has the metastasis developed in relation to the primary tumor. In, for example, in patients who develop many years after the primary pancreatic metastasis, this is a patient that I would consider in the first place for local treatment. It doesn't need to be surgery. It can be radiofrequency ablation, stereotactic radiosurgery. Uh, there is no prospective trial on local treatment in kidney cancer metastasis, but all retrospective trials clearly point toward a survival benefit for local treatment in kidney cancer. So this is something that we should never forget, even if we have wonderful new regimens to treat metastatic disease, but we should not forget about the potential importance of local strategies. Thank you. Another question is, uh, what is the place for PET-CT in uh, renal cancer diagnostics? So there was a single study conducted in the United States on the West Coast, uh, and they had 50% false positive and 50% false negative uh, results. So um, it is not considered a standard procedure in kidney cancer. I know that the surgeons always ask for it when, when I refer a patient, but specifically to a thoracic surgeon, they would always um, ask for a PET CT scan. Um, I always tell them it's useless, but they still want it. So I do it, but I would never do it for my personal interest. All right, so that is uh, that is an important issue. So how do you um, how do you do it then? What so we, what is your preferred right? What is your preferred diagnostic uh, tool? So it's just CT scans and MRI depending on the region. Okay. Now, um, right, and that is the the last question that I have here. Is there a place for the map, the nosumab in 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 uh, bone metastatic patients? So we had, of course, used in the past a lot of um, um, agents that influence um, bone metabolism. We had to come to the, we we made this observation that in combination with uh, anti-VEGF agents, the incidence of osteonecrosis of the jaw is really much higher than observed in other tumor entities or in combination with other therapies. So. Usually, it would not be my first reaction now to prescribe it um, because of that, because we have seen some, so high, such a high incidence of osteonecrosis, but it's not that it's contraindicated. So it can be given, and I would do it from time to time, but not out of a reflex, let's see. Okay. So um, that is, uh, that is uh, the uh, end of this, uh, of this uh, seminar. Thank you very much to everybody. 
Um, we are very happy that you all joined us. And um, I want to particularly thank Quest Maya Squibb for uh, supporting this event, um, uh, which uh, would not be uh, which which would not be possible. So uh, even um, even virtual events uh, are costly and need somebody who, who helps uh, for the propagation of, of news and of uh, new developments. And of course, uh, let me thank very, very much uh, the faculty, uh, which was uh, extremely, extremely helpful and of a, um, a remarkable, of a remarkable quality. So thank you very much uh, to everybody. It was wonderful having you. And uh, I also want to thank the Seacock staff um, and uh, Ms. Fisher, as usual, and uh, Mr. Dietrich, who made all the uh, technical support um, to make this possible. You know, uh, of course, that all these virtual events are very much more difficult than just to step on the stage and take a microphone and speak. So thank you very much to everybody and stay safe and healthy and all the best to everyone. Bye-bye.